Well, let's uh, open our Bibles, if you will, over to Acts chapter 17 this morning. You know, um, I was thinking about this whole year, you know, because we got an extra hour last night to think about 2020. Um, (laughs) And, um, you know, I was thinking how amazed I am at how this has disrupted the entire world, really. Um, You know, at first we thought it would just be first world nations with too much media. Um, But then, you know, friends of mine, I've got a couple of different friends who are working in Ethiopia, not with one another, uh, different parts of the country even. uh, And uh, uh, they were posting how that they're getting to go back to service this week. I got emails from both talking about that and all the restrictions of that even being able to go back to service what their government is requiring. And I'm thinking to myself of what I know about Ethiopia uh, through them is that it's not exactly anything near a first world country. Uh, You know, when they say, hey, you know, uh, typically uh, when we get, you know, uh, bills in our hands, they smell like poop, okay? That's that's what our country, like, just is so, you know, uh, uh, backwards in the cleanliness issues and stuff there. And so, uh, you know, just thinking about that, I mean, it really has disrupted the whole world. And, and not just in the sense of the virus, but there's also the global economic, you know, issues that are going on. Because when you have a financial powerhouse like the United States, and of course our allies, just the whole Western world uh, does business with the entire world so that even small agricultural nations have come to depend on our exportation of food, of spices, of coffee, or what about their natural resources, little known countries where we get our lithium for our cell phone batteries, you know, and so uh, their whole economies become built not on the things that it used to be built on, but simply on servicing our first world demands and hungers. And so as we've shut down economically, it's sometimes shut down entire economies around the world. We get a cold, they get pneumonia. Even closed off nations, friends of mine traveling in small island nations in the South Pacific has said that the virus has come there also. Nothing seems able to stop it from disrupting the world until everyone has been exposed. We can imagine all the reasons why that might be. Could be an attack by the Chinese. Could be God. Don't know, do we? We have to wait and watch and find that one out. But the world has responded to this pandemic by trying to create a vaccine. What does that mean? That means to introduce a dead or a weakened strain of the virus into our body so that we can fight off the real thing. But you know, here's the thing, that even under the most ideal conditions, the virus, the, the, the vaccine doesn't always work. And the reason is, is because the real thing, the live thing always finds a way to overcome the dead and the weak version of it. I think there might be a lesson in there for us. Let's take a look today. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, beginning verse 1. Again, this week I'm going to be reading from the NIV. I just feel like it's so much more readable in this chapter. Uh, And so uh, I'll be reading from the NIV, but please follow on in whatever translation you have. The one in your lap, of course, my absolute favorite. Let's take a look. Acts 17, beginning in verse 1, and we read these words. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollyana, they came to Thessalonica. And there was a Jewish synagogue, and as his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you, is the Messiah, he said. And some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But there were also, but the other Jews were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace and formed a mob and started a riot in the city. 
they rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them to the crowd. But when they did not find them there, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city councils, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. And when they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil, and there they made, they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea, and on arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed and also did a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. But when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. And the believers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed in Berea, and those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him there as soon as possible. Now, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed, seeing that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day, those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. Then they said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him into a meeting of the Areopagus. There they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you were presenting. You were bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we would like to know what they mean. All of the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at all your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you... So you are ignorant of the very thing that you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. And from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times and history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and we have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God has overlooked such ignorance, but now he commends people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day that he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, and a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Blessed be the reading of God's holy word. All right, so chapter 17, let's put the map up here.
All right, so remember, everything started down here in Jerusalem. It went to Antioch. Uh, we went, then went to Antioch, Pisidia. We had all this happening in recent chapters in Galatia. That was where we were even last week. Headed over here, they uh, across Asia, but they were told not to stay in Asia, but to go on uh, to Macedonia. They received the Macedonian call. Last week, we spent a lot of time right here in Philadelphia. And now they have traveled over here to Thessalonica, Berea, and then down here to Athens is where we're headed in this whole discussion. So uh, well into Europe over here uh, at this point. Now, in in your mind, to help you kind of put some of these things in in perspective, uh, after they had great success in Philippi, they go there to Thessalonica. That's about 100 miles away. Now, 100 miles, 21st century, no big deal. 100 miles in Paul's day is at least eight foot, eight days' journey on foot. At least eight days on foot. Not including the fact that they made stops uh, in uh, Amphipolis and Apollyana. So they're easily week and a half, two weeks of journeying easily by the time they get there to Thessalonica. Now, in Thessalonica, they are also having great success. But unlike Philippi, there's a difference in this community because uh, there uh, in Philippi, it was mostly Greeks. Uh, Here in Thessalonica, there is a strong presence of Jews if you'll remember when I was talking about uh, being in Philippi, they were, the Jews were meeting down by the river. They didn't have a synagogue. And so that, that tells you is that there was not ten, at least 10 supporting families. In order to have a synagogue, you have to have at least 10 supporting families to create a synagogue and to call a rabbi and things like that. At least 10 families. That's the minimum requirement can't have any less than that to be considered a synagogue. So in this case, they're not down by the water. Uh, They have a synagogue, and Paul's been reasoning with them in the synagogue uh, for multiple days, uh, three Sabbath days. He's been there a good three weeks. uh, So this didn't happen overnight, right? we got to keep that in mind, that these things are happening that in real time, uh, real live events, and uh, the people, after listening for three weeks, Uh, have kind of come to a crossroads. Some of them have believed on the Lord Jesus for salvation. Others uh, have, uh, you know, instead become irritated by this whole message of Jesus as the Messiah. It doesn't seem to be so much uh, the issue of Jesus as it is that there is jealousy. They are uh, upset because people are listening and they're pulling people away from their synagogue. Maybe it just that they only had 10 families. Maybe they were afraid of uh, kind of losing their synagogue status. I don't know. It doesn't say specifically. Uh, There is an indication that there are more families than that, uh, that they're still strong after that. But, But there's certainly a lot of people, and in particular, not only are Jews believing, but there are, there are proselytes, that means people who've actually converted to Judaism, and they are being carried away. There are some prominent women who are supporting the synagogue. Uh, they're not allowed to be members, uh, but they're prominent, and they are apparently helping to support things. So it could be maybe the old checkbook is taking a hit here, I don't know. Uh, I would say that probably at least minimally is involved. And, and then there's these God-fearing Greeks. There's people who are believers who haven't gone all the way to becoming proselytes, but they're certainly a part of the synagogue. And that's what leads to their persecution, right? And, and there, when it, they were persecuted in uh, Philippi, uh, it was a handful of people who stirred up, but they mostly got... Uh, some, you know, bad actors to do this. But in this case, in this case, it's the jealousy among the leaders of the synagogue who then do what believers are never supposed to do. They join forces with the world to persecute other believers with whom they disagree. Can I just emphasize that over and over again? There is no place for the church to go running to the world to state our case, that that is 
patently unbiblical, that the place where we take our case is that we, we deal with one another, we encourage one another, but we don't go to the courts, we don't go other places uh, trying to incite people to agree with us and then turn against other believers. That is just patently unbiblical. In this case, that's exactly what they do. They join forces with the world to persecute these believers to the point of inciting a riot. And when they could not find Paul to abuse, they mistreat Jason. Now that's a big deal because, listen, Jason, up to that point, has been one of their own synagogue members. So in other words, somebody that they've known for, for, for seemingly forever, somebody who they've been in relationship with, they are so determined to win, they're so determined to, they're, they're so enraged by their jealousy that they're not just going to the world looking for support, but they are turning on their own. In fact, the indication here in the Greek is that they have literally using anti-Semitic phrases that are often used against Jews there in Greco-Roman culture to stir people up and basically say, when they say this whole thing of they're advocating foreign gods, listen, Judaism is not illegal at this point in time in Rome. It has a legal status. It is allowed to be practiced. That's why there are prominent Jews and Greeks together in the synagogue, right? That's why there are prominent women. That's why there are proselytes. It is legal to practice Judaism in the Roman Empire. But the, these Jews then pick up this language of the anti-Semites in order to attack the people from the, that are preaching Christ in their midst. I want you to think about that. I mean, what would incite someone so much to the point over jealousy, over disagreement, that you would even begin to implore the language of the very people who hate you in order to go after the people that you're jealous of? Is that not sick? Is there not something just, I mean, just from a, a, a mental, emotional standpoint that you have to say to yourself, there's something really messed up about that. And yet, their jealousy, their desire to be prominent, to be in this place, uh, uh, to, to have their synagogue uh, respected and everything, they are so out of, of sync with the Spirit of God that they're willing to mistreat their own and use the language of their own enemies to wreck havoc. Listen, I want to submit to you that the reason that Judaism falls into such great contempt in the Roman Empire uh, through the, through the Christ, beginning of the Christian age is in part this, that they go around sowing anti-Semitism in, the, in their great effort to try to shut down the church. They begin borrowing that language from the anti-Semites around them, and what they don't realize is that when Christianity becomes illegal, so does Judaism. They are literally cutting off their nose to spite their own face. This is when you, like, you begin to eat your own. This is the kind of accusation that Madeleine Murray O'Hare, when she uh, became, was such an advocate uh, in the United States of America of destroying Christianity and getting any kind of Christian ethic out of our schools and things like that, it was one of her greatest arguments. Look, just watch these Christians. They will turn on one another in order to get position, power, and recognition from the world around them. Watch. We can just set them against one another and they will devour themselves. They will devour one another. Watch what happens when one of their number falls. They will all circle around and consume them. They will destroy them. They will speak evil against them. They will not do it quietly in their own circle and correct things. They will run to the world and talk about how horrible this person is and why you should listen to us. This is how we will defeat them. Have they done a good job? Oh, yeah. Because the first persons to turn usually against one another uh, in Christianity are like evangelicals and liberals. And when we get in a fight about some point of doctrine, we take it to the world. And then we get everybody to join our side, whether it's political parties or philosophies or science or whoever else, to talk about how the other group is stupid. And we feel like we've won an argument 
And the world goes, yeah, we'll agree with you for right now while we help you destroy the Christian church and its credibility in your land. They've done a fantastic job. So keep in mind, here we are, we're about 17 to 20 years after the resurrection of Jesus, or about two years after the Jerusalem Council. So now they've traveled there from Jerusalem over here to, to uh, Thessalonica, and uh, just to kind of give you a, a little idea, we're talking well over 2,000 miles, Shoe Leather Express. It's pretty impressive when you think about it that way, because if I say we've traveled 2,000 miles in the gospel, well, you and I can get on a plane and be there today. Not a big deal. But when you're talking about the gospel moving through households and building relationships and discipling people, spending sometimes years in cities and, and, and bringing those people to understand and to know the gospel, and we're talking about literally weeks of spending time in a synagogue, just beginning to gather a group together to begin to be discipled, you're talking about a really long process. And, and amazingly... I mean, really, truly, amazingly, the gospel's gone 2,000 miles over hill and dale and traveling here and there and, and bringing these people to a point that people like Jason will, allow, will, will go through this kind of abuse and still side with the gospel. There's that deep-seated conviction. See, that there's not a thought on their part, well, man, gosh, I, I came to Jesus and everything didn't get better in my life. Boy, I guess this Christianity stuff doesn't work. You know, I mean, I came to Jesus and everything in my life didn't get better. My hair didn't get shinier. My teeth didn't get whiter. Boy, I guess Christianity doesn't work. I, I just hear that complaint a whole lot about from disaffected church folks. Why don't I go to church? Well, it just doesn't work. I want to say, have you ever tried it? I don't mean going to church, I mean Jesus. But in this mentality, you know, uh, 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 here Jason goes through all of this and he has heard enough that he, he's understanding and he understands the basic premise of the message is that when Jesus comes in our life, it, it, it radically changes our life. And, and with it, Paul repeatedly says over and over again, as we see in all of his letters, that with the gospel comes, yes, certain blessings, but also persecution. It is the normative way. When you read from uh, throughout the scriptures, whether you start in Genesis or you start in Matthew, either way, you read uh, the, the, the normal societal pressure of the world around us persecutes the church. That's normal. When we don't have that, we rejoice we use it and are fruitful in it, and whenever we're not fruitful in it, I guarantee you it will be taken away. So, in this case, as the gospel has gone a couple of thousand miles and, and this situation is being stirred up, one of the accusations is, and I love this accusation, these people who have gone all over the world disrupting things, they have come here also. Now, I want you to think about the real context of this for just a moment. It's an exciting statement, but can I just get you to think for just a moment about first century Christianity? There are thousands of believers at this point, but there are not millions. We can name the points along the way where Paul has been and the church has been established. And so when we say the whole world has gone after him, there's, there's a sense of overstatement, isn't there, in the very nature of it. I mean, it's, it's part of their political ploy. I mean, these people have gone everywhere. And yet there's another sense in which I believe in the minds of those who are trying to discredit Paul and them that it really is like, oh my, 
The whole world. Listen, it started down in Jerusalem, and look, it's come all the way up here. It's 2,000 miles away. If you're living in a world of Shoe Leather Express where the average person never travels more than 10 miles from their own home at any given time, the idea that they have come here and brought the gospel, literally, it seems like the whole world is chasing after these people. This is magnanimous. This is crazy. Well, and look. Look what they're doing to our synagogue. We had a beautiful little synagogue, and then they came, and they started sharing new things, and like, like it's, you know, they're disrupting everything. They're, ma- they're making a mess of things. They've turned us against one another. My word's not theirs, literally, but I'm sure that was part of it. And they're not only converting people from Judaism, but from paganism. And so there is some certain validity in their hearts and minds, certainly. It feels like the whole world's going this way. Do you ever feel like the whole world is going some way because of news or information or things that you hear? And sometimes you just have to step back to get perspective for just a moment to recognize that. I mean, sometimes it just feels like everything is going a particular way. Uh, you know, I, I know that the, the modern church today is convinced that Christianity is losing ground in the world. The news media is glad to let you think that. They don't like to cover the stories in which we hear that actually the gospel is advancing faster in the last 50 years than it has uh, in its entire history. That over half of all the people who have ever claimed to be Christians, ever, in the 2,000 plus year history of the church, that the majority of those people are still alive right at this moment. Right at this moment, there are more people alive who are professing Christians, who are living their life for Christ, than the entire history of the Christian church. But you don't know that if you listen to other voices. You see, and so sometimes we hear these other voices and we look at our own society, like the United States, where we see Christianity losing ground, and then we all look at one another and say, woe is me, the whole world is chasing after atheism. No, it's not. Not even remotely. Can I just tell you, atheism is very isolated in the world, because most of the world knows that atheism is the dumbest thing ever. You have to be really well-educated to conclude that, not, that nothing, everything came from nothing. You, it takes a lot of sophistry to convince yourself of something so ridiculous. However, globally, Christianity is growing, and then you and I can easily sit here in the West and listen to our newscasts and everything else and go, the whole world's falling apart. We're all going to die. Christianity's losing ground in the United States and Western Europe. Globally, we are on the advance like never before. So what's the difference? The difference is the rest of the world knows it's persecuted and the rest of us here are like confused because every time somebody says they disagree with us, we run and hide. Or we shut up and we become the silent majority. I'm not sure how exactly that works, but anyhow. So in the midst of this, these Jewish leaders used that phrase that was so disparaging. And there's the riots, people so blind on their own ambition that they are willing to destroy and riot and everything else. In the Thessalonican church, here's the thing that draws my attention. We have two books, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. I've actually preached through them. Do you remember that, some of you? If you remember that when we read the book of Thessalon- the, to the, the letters to the Thessalonians, that the, the premise was this. Life is hard, but I, I, but I want you to stand in faith. I want you to believe. I want you to, to stand in the face of all your trial, trouble, and persecution. And one of the things that's interesting is that when you get to the letters, uh, the first few letters there in the book of Revelation, those couple, first couple of chapters there, that, that Thessalonia is one of the only churches in that region that doesn't get a letter that says, what are you doing? 
Are, have you completely lost your mind? See, the Thessalonian church was birthed in persecution. And you know what happens to the, pers- to the Thessalonian church? He writes two letters because they were so persecuted, because their troubles were so great, because so much was coming after them, that they stand strong and are faithful to this very day that the church in Thessalonica has never disappeared. On the other hand, we can travel around this route where the church wasn't persecuted and there's no church today. In fact, we can go back just about... 500 years, and there was no church because they couldn't stand, because they had been so guarded, so protected, and when tough times came their way, what'd they do? Faded dead away. The moment things got difficult. Can I just tell you right now, I know everybody's worried about Tuesday. Here's what I'm really wondering. Regardless of the outcome, who is your faith actually in? come Wednesday morning. I just think it's time that we quit whining or thinking that God is taken by surprise or incapable. See, because here's what I know. Either A, you're right about what God is doing, or B, you were wrong and you need to adjust to what He's doing because He's king of the universe, not you. And not any president. Because can I tell you, they can both fail you. Can I tell you, they both will. I don't care which one gets in office. They will fail you. They're human beings. So, the Thessalonian church is so persecuted, Paul writes them two letters, and here there, in the face of persecution, they stand strong, and then... and. Do you know that their intense persecution continued for 250 years without a reprieve? 250 years. That's how the church was birthed. 250 years of persecution. They didn't get a break for 250 years. That's as long, no, that's longer, church, than we've been a nation. And somehow, the church survived and grew. And grew to the point that eventually that they won back popular opinion. Hmm. It's almost like it might be a plan or something. So Paul and company, they leave Thessalonica uh, in the middle of of these things. I think this time, you know, I noticed that he doesn't appeal to his citizenship. I don't know why. My guessing is, is at this point that the riot and everything is so out of control that there's no reasoning with anyone anymore. You ever been to a point where you can't reason with anybody anymore? Mm -hmm. And in the middle of that, when they're ready to kill Paul, uh, they, they, you know, they, they, they head off to the next town. Paul doesn't appeal to his citizenship. They get out of town. The church is left there, uh, to, and they keep sending people back in different trips, and we read about things in Thessalonians that give us the idea that how they continue to strengthen the church. They go on to Berea, 45 miles away to Berea. So we're talking walking again. Probably three to four days of walking. Might have got there in three days. Probably four. You know, wagon trains, people walking typically, especially if you're carrying things. You're not just on the race. If you're carrying your luggage and things, you, even if it's a little, you're talking about three to four days of walking. And the Bereans there, those Berean Jews are more noble because they search the Scriptures. In other words, they're searching the Old Testament to see that these things are true. And they, as they are studying the Old Testament, they become convinced of what Paul is teaching, and they're, they're excited about what he's teaching. And then there's these people up in Thessalonica that they so hate Paul, they couldn't stand it, and it's not enough to have burned down their own city, but now they're going to go to the next place and cause problems there. Who's the people going around causing all the problems? I, I need a little refreshment here. I'm not certain anymore. They're stirring up all these things in such a desire to defend their own viewpoint. And again, they use that same rhetoric that was once used to persecute and intimidate their own people. We might ask, why didn't they learn? We might say, wow, look at what they look at what they learned. 
you know, here's the thing. When you're mistreated by somebody, there are two potential reactions. One is to promise yourself you will never do life like them. And the other, which is unintentional, is you become exactly like them. Right? There's, there's two people who defend children that have been molested. There's those who were molested themselves as children, and they say, I will never let that happen to another child. Not in my lifetime. Not under my watch. And then there are those who become the child molesters. You know, when people are abused by power, there are two types. Remember, in the French Revolution, those who were, were so sick and tired of what the monarchs did to them that they used the guillotine to then persecute anybody who didn't agree with them. They became just as despotic and destructive, even though they set out to bring about a revolution of freedom and hope. It's been true over and over again throughout history. So when you and I are responding to the people around us, you know, the way of the world is to bully, to slander, to intimidate. Church, when would it be, ever be okay for you and I to either join forces with the world or just practice what the world practices when we interact with people that we don't agree with, who've mistreated us? See, I think the very spirit of that passage when Jesus says about turning the other cheek is, is not talking about pacifism. It is very much a response to how you continue relationship. See, the context of that slap on the cheek is the embrace. When you are in fellowship with somebody, that you embrace them. And if you should go to embrace them and they hit you on the cheek, that you would Submit the other cheek also in order to maintain the relationship. When is it ever encouraged in the scripture that you and I, having been mistreated by the world and its powers, are ever commanded to join forces with or to act like the world? I, I just don't find that. See, I, I, I'm, I'm not a pacifist. On the other hand, I don't want to be like the world. Why do we? So when you find yourself getting angry with another believer, can I just say that please don't go to the world for comfort. Please don't post that on your Facebook and if you, if you really believe that God is the answer, if you really believe that He's the one who's sovereign, then it ought to actually manifest itself in how you hold your tongue and how you respond to people. We don't need the world to join our side. The way you get the people of the world to join your side is you make disciples of Jesus Christ, who make disciples of Jesus Christ, who make disciples of Jesus Christ. And when we quit making disciples, we not only flagrantly disobey the final command of Jesus. But listen, we disrupt the process. When we put our hope and our trust in large events and, and evangelism forums and things like that, but we don't actually make disciples of Jesus Christ ourselves. We've said, Jesus, you're not king of my life. I will do it my way. I have a better plan, a better way. And then we go running to the world's techniques. Quite often, like, look, I, I've just, we're trying to compete with Disney and everything else. I can just tell you, the church doesn't have that kind of money. It will never work. It's not in how many Christian movies we make. I have nothing against Christian movies. You can watch all the Christian movies you want, but that is not going to save the world. Our political parties are not going to save this country. So what are we learning, and who are we learning it from? Now, the problem gets so out of hand that Paul has to flee to Athens. 
another hundred miles away. Just he and a couple of people from the church, they go. We're talking easily eight days of walking without Paul and you know, without uh, Silas and Timothy. Uh, I, I guarantee you that was a difficult walk for him and a difficult journey. He gets there, um, gets to Corinth, another 50 you know, miles away. Uh, and, and then, you know, uh, but in Athens... Paul goes again to the synagogue, he speaks in the marketplace, and there he becomes distressed by the idolatry he saw and heard. Anybody ever been a little distressed by the idolatry you see and hear in the world around you? Listen to Paul's way of handling it. He goes to the marketplace and he begins to find those students and professors under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, he finds those who were spending their whole day debating and listening to the latest ideas. Now, listen, you and I know Paul is the most educated apostle, but these men had little regard for him. They call him a babbler. In other words, what they're saying is he doesn't speak Greek very well. Some of the finest Greek in the New Testament. And they're saying, yeah, yeah you don't speak Greek very well. I guess he had an accent, didn't sound like a Greek guy or whatever else. Uh, you know, uh, his word choices maybe. They smugly look down on him. And yet, as Paul doesn't choose to run and duck his tail, but engages them, they become enamored and they invite him to address the whole Areopagus. Today, we would call something like an Areopagus a university, where people sit around and debate the latest ideas, right? Could be Facebook, I don't know, probably not. Paul, following the lead of the Holy Spirit, takes the opportunity to speak and begins with common ground. He identifies the unknown God, which he has identified as the God who made the world and everything in it. Now, I want you to keep this in mind. You know, here, Athens is the home to the giants of philosophy, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, the most famous citizens of all of Athens, who had argued some 350 to 400 years earlier, depending on you know, where, where, where you start in the uh, thing, but you know, across a period of about 50 years there, those three men lived, and they had pushed the idea of what? Monotheism. They were against idolatry, and they complained that hedonism was destroying their society. What? So as he preaches these things, they have, they have, you know, that there's, they have no problem with the idea that there could be a God who created all things and that all this, this multiplicity of gods is a ridiculous idea because they've considered these ideas before. He's building on common ground. What does he do when he goes to the synagogue? He's building on common ground. What did they do there in Jerusalem? They built on common ground and then they preached the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Always the line in the sand. Always, always, always. But he begins with the common ground, and there he shares these things with them, and they've got no problem. They find that interesting. Uh, they want to know more. They, they've accepted this idea uh, uh, of that, that God could become human in the person of Jesus Christ. Why? Well, their mythology has a lot of gods becoming human, so that's not too hard for them. And they accepted the idea of a God of repentance and forgiving ignorance, and they said, that makes sense. We can do all of those things. That sounds good. And it really would have been easy for him to have done the altar call right there right? You guys all agree with me. We're all on the same page. But yet, here's what Paul must do to be faithful to preach the gospel. After having appealed by history, philosophy, and the religion of the Greeks, he preaches the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And church, I would submit to you that the resurrection is probably the greatest stumbling block to the entire world sometimes even to the church. I mean, the world can testify to healings. The world accepts prayer. We can build bridges through philosophy, history, and religion. But in the end, the world will do everything possible to discredit the resurrection because it's the line in the sand that says that he who resurrected from the dead and continues to live is king of life and death, who has authority over life and dead because not even the Greek gods have that power. 
It's never been considered. The world has never seen resurrection. For that matter, most of the church has never seen resurrection. And, and, and here in the Western church, uh, listen, we have reduced the resurrection to some kind of ghostly, ethereal event rather than the physical, bodily resurrection of the dead. You hear it all the time, people talking about like, going to heaven like it's someplace that's mythical, real, sitting on clouds, cherub angels sitting there playing harps all day. I can't think of anything that sounds less like heaven than that. But the Scripture is really clear that it is the bodily, physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here, put your finger in my hands. He sits and he eats with them and he proclaims to them the resurrection of the dead, the general resurrection in which he will divide them right and left, those that go into eternal happiness and those who do not. It's not something that's real. It's not a ghost. It's not just some spiritual experience. And yet we've done everything we can to turn heaven into floating on clouds and stuff like that. The scripture's clear. Without the resurrection, you and I have no hope. That's part of what Paul teaches to the Thessalonians. It's part of what he teaches to the Philippians is that there is, without the bodily resurrection, we have no hope. This is a non-negotiable belief. And if you reject the physical bodily resurrection, then you have something absolutely different than Christianity. So those in the text who rejected the resurrection, it says really clearly, they rejected it all. Those who were undecided, undecided because of the resurrection, decided they wanted to hear more. They wanted to know more, but they understood that this is the line in the sand. And those who believed in the resurrection, Dionysus, Damaris, and others, they believed the whole message, and this text says, and they were saved. But the point is, is that there's no getting around the resurrection. Without the resurrection, there is no gospel. There isn't any good news. Paul said to the Corinthian church that they were saved by the power of the resurrection, not by the power of Jesus' death. Let me hit that for you again because I think a lot of us miss that. Paul said that the Corinthian, to the Corinthian church that they were saved by the power of the resurrection, not by the power of Jesus' death. You see, the cross without the resurrection was just the persecution of another rebellious peasant. If he died and he's still in the grave, you are dead in your sin without hope, without the resurrection of, uh, of your future either. The cross without the resurrection is, is just persecution. The only way the cross redeems us is that Jesus rises from the dead and gives us that hope. And if we water down the gospel to make it palatable to those who find the resurrection a stumbling block, Maybe we just don't bring it up. Maybe we skip over it and we ask people to submit to a gospel of warm fuzzies and hope without ever explaining that it is based on our confidence in the resurrection. Listen, Hollywood loves heaven, right? I mean, they make movies all the time about it. And in Hollywood folk folklore, Everybody goes to heaven. They have the best rock band. They have the greatest movies because all the stars go to heaven. Just listen to them. They will tell you that they do. That's their worldview. And you cannot disprove it because no one can investigate it or evaluate the truth of their statements. And then there's the resurrection. There is only one who claims to raise from the dead and stays that way. There is only one empty tomb. See, there were others that Jesus raised from the dead, but eventually they still ended up in a tomb. That includes Lazarus. But there is only one empty tomb. Church? That is the line in the sand. That's the message that turns the world upside down. And that's the message in which we give ourselves to. It's not life improvement. It's not home improvement. It is the idea that Jesus Christ is king. Not just king of my heart. Not just king of my life. Not just king of my ideology. But he is king 
even over the powers of life and death. That is what we signed up for. Let's stand together, shall we? We hope you enjoyed worshiping with us. If you would like more info about any of the ministry opportunities or to stay connected, please visit myvineyard.church. If you're watching us on YouTube, stay up to date with us by subscribing and hitting the notification bell. You can also connect to us through Facebook or Instagram. God bless. We'll see you next week.